Hi there. Kenneth Scott Laderette, Christianity Takes Shape in Organization and Doctrine in His History of Christianity. He's already been dealing with the post-Nicene Christ Christological controversies. The nature of Christ is still being explained and uh, Christian theologians are differing in their explanations as to why Christ or how Christ can be both man and God at the same time. This section deals more particularly with the contribution of Nestorius, who is the Bishop of Constantinople. It says, as Bishop of Constantinople, Nestorius was zealous in attacking heresy, especially the remnants of the Arians. However, reared as he had been in the theological atmosphere of Antioch, he was reluctant to employ theotokos, that is, the word that was now being applied to God-bearing. He was reluctant to employ theotokos in his sermons, but preferred instead Christotokos. Christ-bearing, or mother of Christ, not God-bearing, or mother of God. This aroused Cyril. Apparently, he was all the more keen to scent heresy because his critics were complaining about him to the emperor and to Nestorius. Nestorius had interested himself in the situation, and Cyril, partly moved by injured pride, welcomed an opportunity to shift attention from himself to the challengeable views of his rival. Nestorius was not always tactful, circulated his convictions widely, and dealt harshly with monks who dared to denounce him. Cyril came out in favor of Theotokos, and a sharp exchange of letters took place between himself and Nestorius. Both men wrote to their fellow bishop, Celestine of Rome. Celestine found against Nestorius, possibly because the latter had not been as deferential to him as had Cyril, and possibly also because Nestorius had displayed a certain degree of hospitality to some Pelagians, of whom we are to hear more a little later, who had fled to Constantinople. In 430, a synod at Rome ordered Nestorius either to recant or be excommunicated. Also in the year 430, Cyril convened a synod in Alexandria, which condemned the positions which he maintained were those of Nestorius. Among them were the failure to use Theotokos and the separation of the divine and human nature in Christ in such fashion that Christ was viewed as a God-bearing man and that Jesus is, as a man, energized by the Logos of God. Except for their reluctance to use Theotokos, Nestorius had not taught them. The dispute waxed so warm that a general council was called by imperial order to deal with it. The bishops assembled at Ephesus in 431, in what is usually called the Third Ecumenical Council. Cyril and his supporters reached the city first, without waiting for the friends of Nestorius, a party of bishops from Antioch, the council convened under the presidency of Cyril, and when Nestorius declined to appear before it until the other bishops arrived, under the leadership of his chief accuser in a single long day session, it condemned and deposed him. Stirred up by their bishop, Memnon, the Ephesian populace, committed acts of violence against Nestorius and his supporters. When not long thereafter, John, the bishop of Antioch, and the bishops with him came, they organized themselves, claiming to be the legitimate council, and condemned Cyril and Memnon as Arians and Apollinarians, and deposed and excommunicated them. The bishops in Cyril's council numbered about 200, and, chose, and those in, in John's, 43. A few days later, when the representatives of Bishop Celestine of Rome reached Ephesus, the majority council resumed its sessions and excommunicated Bishop John and his party. Both sides appealed to the emperor, and the latter, for the moment, confirmed the de deposition of Cyril, Memnon, and Nestorius, and endeavored to bring the two factions together and heal the, church, heal the breach. Nestorius was commanded, henceforth, to live in a monastery. A temporary peace was patched up when in 433 John of Antioch sent to Cyril a creed which declared Jesus Christ to be quote, true God and true man, consisting of a reasonable soul and a body, end of quote, and the Virgin Mary to be Theotokos, that is, bearer of God. To this 
Creed, Cyril subscribed. Nestorius remained in exile most of the time, especially in Egypt, apparently in Egypt, and often in great physical and mental distress. In his painful seclusion, he wrote extensively in his own defense, setting forth his version of the unhappy controversy and elaborating a statement of his, of his faith. From this, it is not entirely clear whether he held the views which have been associated with his name, the presence of the divine and human in Jesus Christ in such a fashion that there were in him two distinct beings or persons, rather than, as the majority of you have held, two natures concurring in one person and one substance. One of the works written by Nestorius in exile bore the title Tragedy. That might be a description of the life of the author and of the group of which he was the central figure, and also be illustrative of one aspect of the course of the gospel. In his youth, giving himself completely to Christ, and in pursuance of that dedication, caught up in the monastic movement, in the prime of his manhood, Nestorius was called to be to one of the most exalted positions in the Catholic Church, the leadership of the Church in the Empire's second capital, Constantinople. There, in his zeal for Christ, as he understood him, Nestorian, Nestorius rather, aroused the bitter enmity of fellow Christians who also believed themselves to be loyal to Christ and held that by his preaching Nestorius dishonored him. The leader of the opposition, Cyril, in part confused allegiance to Christ with personal ambition. Scenes followed which were a denial of the love and therefore of the faith to which both parties were theoretically committed. Nestorius, defeated, languished long years in exile. Outraged and perhaps perplexed, he again and again went over the events and the convictions which had brought him to that pass. He believed himself to have been right, but his thinking appears either to have been too subtle or not clear-cut. Dragging out his years and his banishment, Nestorius perished in obscurity, while his successful rival continued in office and died amidst the trappings of ecclesiastical splendor. Neither man was perfect, either in his adherence to Christian moral standards or in his thinking. Through both, the church was further divided. Yet both had been, in their own eyes, sincere. In a sense, they were typical of the entire Christian church and epitomized the problem presented by the gospel in the world. Next time, Nestorianism finds a refuge in the Persian Empire. I put in a link to the three videos we did on the deity of Christ in the early church. They're all linked together. Along with the... Uh, I should refer to the fact that all of that document was based on a PDF that is now on onewonders.org website, so you can get the entire document there. Next time, Nestorianism finds a refuge in the Persian Empire.